Hi, my friends. Welcome to Inside the Minds of Authors. I'm DC Gomez, your host and also an indie author. I'm thrilled you're joining me today for another fun interview with a passionate author. We're going to kick off this show with an exciting reading, so let's get started. Hi, I'm Grace Salmon, and I'm delighted to be with DC Gomez tonight to talk about my new novel, The Eves. It's my fourth book, but my debut novel. And I'm going to read you just a short section of it. Basically, I want to let you know that it's the story of Jessica Barnett, who's very confused about her life. She's 50-ish, and she meets this group of much older, very diverse women of color and colorful women. And she does their life stories. And this small chapter here is going to be about when she's sitting with this older white woman, former nun, who really helps Jessica understand that she needs to listen. Jessica, close your eyes. And Jessica does so. Think about yourself. Is the image you create of a woman near 60 with slightly sagging jowl, lines, a hint of gray, and with lines on her face and veins clearly visible on her hands? She must notice that I wince, Jessica thinks. Let me shift to something more comfortable. When you think of any of us here, Jessica, what do you see? You see our age, how our bodies sag, how it takes us a bit of time to get up from prayer. You are surprised that you learn that we do things like Photoshop. Keep your eyes closed. You imagine yourself as very young next to us, somehow giving you a feeling of youth and immortality. You note our gray hairs and our agedness, and you are ready to write our histories because you think our lives are over and behind us. You think we are done. Open your eyes, Jessica. We are not, as I fear you believe, done our lives. We have probably had our first dates, our first cars, our first loves, our careers, the deaths of those close to us, life-threatening awakenings, and so on. I am not convinced, however, that we are done or even had all of our firsts. The rest of what time we have left would be entirely boring if that were the case. Jessica, as long as you hold the preconceived notion of us, you will never know the truth of us. Do not write the stories about the beginning of our lives because you have judged that we have come to the end. Jessica, once upon a time we were girls and we believe we still are. We are still very much alive. In many ways, we are at the beginning, and to not understand that is wrongheadedness. That's the story about a little piece of the Eves and how I got here after writing three educational books and starting four other companies. So thanks for having me, DC. everyone and welcome to another episode of Inside the Minds of Authors. Today we have the amazing Miss Grace with us and gave us a really provocative reading into very much very social issues that we tend to deny. Age, getting old, and facing those things. So hello madam, how are you today? I'm fabulous and just so happy to be here with you to discuss things. I'm so excited to have you. I know our listeners can't wait to get started. So we're going to jump right in. This is your first novel, which is exciting. You have educational books because you got me thinking. I'm like, woo, we need to talk about that. But where did this book come from? Tell us about that part. Well, you know, DC, I was 57. I had been traveling 200 days a year. I had been working in 32 states. And I was tired, and my business was beginning to run down a little bit in terms of I was beginning to focus differently. I was doing more writing. My other three books are all in the field of education. But my children were now adults. My parents were deceased. And it really was a change in perspective of me, for me, of who was I without those roles of mother, daughter, et cetera. So I began to do what I normally do, which is to approach my life through writing. You know, I some people make lists to go to the grocery store or to-do list. But ever since I was a child, I thought, I'd like to sit and write things out. And all of a sudden, the story began to take shape. That is very exciting. Especially because you decided to take a leap in your life in a different direction. 
Well, and it's funny you should focus on that particular piece, because I think for me, the book is very much about taking that leap. The main character is super stuck. She's given up on her career and her hopes, her ambitions, her looks, but not her fear or guilt or her vodka. And it's all about her taking enormous leaps. And if I had one message to talk about in terms of the book, it would be that we are never done. We need to leave our mark on the land, even if that's in small, small ways with a neighbor. So yes, it's that taking that leap, which was very exciting because I didn't know I was going to do that when I just first started writing it. You had a passage in the book that just grabbed me from the beginning. It's the fact that she says you can't write her stories from the beginning when you think we have reached the end. How often do we look at people that way? We look at this like, oh, your life is over and we dismiss them. We do that all the time. And I think I was very influenced by what I thought was a Ben Midler song, but was really a John Prine song about looking at old people and remembering to stop and don't stop and stare as if you don't care. Say hello in there. Hello. And I've got that song and several others up on my website. And it was really an inspiration that too often certainly about old people, but I think I've learned in the last year, we make a lot of judgments around people this year in so many different ways. And I really hope that we learn to not make those judgments and that we listen. One of the most beautiful things, I went to a seminar and one of the doctors there has mentioned, we're one of the few cultures that looks at old age as something horrible happening to us. You know, in her culture, it's something to be revered. She's like, I can't wait to get old. I can't wait for my hair to turn gray. I can't wait to hit that stage in my life that is so beautiful. And it took me a minute. It took me back to realize it is a really beautiful age. It's you going through your life and embracing it. Well, I think that's very, very important. You know, you and I became friends on Instagram. There are very few people my age out there. I'm 67. It's been a huge stretch. You talk about taking that leap. Just learning the multiple technologies has been a challenge. Releasing a book in a pandemic is a challenge. But that concept of aging, I'm very lucky. I'm very, very healthy right now. Um, I'm active. I play pickleball. I play tennis. I walk. So I can say I very much enjoy my age now. But that's not to say there aren't moments of horror without offending or scaring off your listeners where, you know, you look at yourself in the mirror and it's not the pretty sight it might have been in a younger age. And there is something about embracing it and understanding it. The characters in the book, the youngest is 15, the oldest is 94. As I mentioned before, they're women of color and colorful women. They're black men. There's a Latino family, a Latinx family. There's a lesbian couple. So there's a lot of diversity. And it's that idea that as we age, we have a lot of things in common. We get to learn from our diversity as well. One of the other things, just to pick up back on what you were talking about in terms of aging, is wanting to age well. And how do we want to age? Who do we want to age with? All of us have seen people challenge this year about living in nursing homes or loved ones not being able to get together. And the Eves talks about women living in community and the men they love living in community and creating a world where aging is embraced very differently. It is such a very interesting topic nowadays. It is very interesting just to look at age from the perspective, if we stop looking at it as a downsize and look at something as another stage in our life that can be fun, that can be exciting, and that is not supposed to be looked upon, oh my God, I'm going to die. So that's very exciting. Absolutely. The other thing that I find particularly freeing about this age is I was initially kind of afraid of losing my role as president of an educational consulting firm or educational author or wife or mother or child. And that was a little scary. Like if I didn't have those roles, who was I? What I'm finding about this age is it is delightful to not have roles, to be your authentic self, to not have to worry about so many things. And I understand that in some ways that's because of the privilege that my parents gave me of my education and the work history I had. So I don't want to say that it's not still a struggle for many men and women my age and older, but there is a gift in being this age and just being more settled, knowing who you are, not needing to impress, knowing who you want to spend time with and who you don't. 
that alone makes a huge difference. And I kind of joke with people. I tell everybody, you know, 40s is probably my best time ever. They're like, really? It's like, you just have a lot more freedom to be yourself and to be authentic. I think authentic has become the key word for everything. So let's talk a little bit about the book again. Is this the standalone or are you making a series out of this? What is this novel? Give me a little more. Thank you. It's interesting. I thought it was a standalone and I've begun work on another novel, which is not at all connected. But many of my readers have asked, please, for another novel. There are lots and plots, plots, twists and turns in the novel. There's some very shocking ending. The oldies, as I call them, the women who are 70, 80s and 90s, they really do some amazing things towards the end of the book. They're doing some amazing things throughout the book. But there have been a lot of requests for that. I had initially said that's not going to happen, but it might. I'm like that you're considering it, that you're entertaining the possibility, which is the best part. Absolutely. If the the story is there and it comes to you, that's even better. But you are writing about something else. Do you want to tell us about it or we want to wait? What What is it? There's an adoption story in The Eves that really took me by surprise. Interestingly enough, one of my readers came to me right before the book was released, I think, and told me that she had given up 54 years ago a daughter for adoption, and her daughter had just found her. So here, this woman I know who's in her 70s, 54 years later, is just for the first time in her life a mom. And I was very struck by their stories how they've had 54 years of kind of marching towards each other. That's going to be towards the end of the book, I think. And then there's a story about immigration at the beginning of the book. I have a girlfriend, and we can talk about writing and where you get your inspiration from. I have a girlfriend who emigrated to this country at the age of three because her parents had one single egg a week that they could divide between their three daughters. And so they moved to the United States. So I have this concept, the the name of the book is The Egg. And it's this, how this egg transformed this entire family's history. They would have stayed where they were, and now they've come here. And so somehow these two stories, I don't know how it's going to work yet. These two stories are going to march together and meet. I love it. I love the fact that you're giving yourself enough space to create. So are you technically a pantser is what you're telling me? Because you're going by the seat of your pants. So pantsers are people who actually just write whatever comes to them without an outline. Planners will actually write the outline. We'll, we will dry it down and figure out what it comes. But the way you're writing, it sounds more like you just let it flow. I haven't heard of that term before. So thanks for teaching me something. As an educator, I love to learn. I think I'm a little bit of both. In education, we talk very much about starting with the end in mind, and that's a curriculum thing. If you you want your kids to know this at the end, what do you have to do to get there? So I knew what I wanted to happen to Jessica at the end of my novel, and then I had to build back from that. I'm a little bit of a planner, but for me, even in my educational books, I knew the end, I knew the start. It was the whole middle I didn't understand at all. And that's one of the fun things. You know, you're such a creative author as well. I love it when my characters talk to me in my head. And I always sound weird, right? When you you listen to other authors and they go, oh, and the the characters take me to places I didn't know we'd go. I always think, oh, they sound like crazy people. But it's true, right? They live in our heads. They live in our hearts. You know, it's like imagining a conversation you'd have with a girlfriend or a parent. And all of a sudden it gets in your hands and flows out the end of your fingers. It's hard to explain it to non-writers when you say, and they took over the book. They're like, what do you mean? I thought you wrote it. Technically, yes, but not really. So yes, it happens all the time. So no, you don't sound crazy to another writer. I completely understand exactly where you're going with that. That's why I love being interviewed by other authors, because when I say things like that, they don't like raise their eyes, go, oh, well, scary. Nope, nope. We completely get it because we're right there with you. We know exactly where you mean. And it is that creative process of pretty much getting into agreement with your characters on your story. And you bring the best of you and they bring the same thing and you meet at the page. So it's like dating your characters and you bring the <laughs> best out of them. 
Well, it's funny you should say that because one of the favorite characters in my book is a character named Roy Gillis. And he's the handyman that's helping Jessica fix up her beautiful townhouse. And he cooks and he's a wonderful man and he's always upbeat and he plays musical instruments and he's super talented. And people will tell me about my characters all the time. Oh, you know, all of your characters are so believable except for that guy, Roy Gillis. That guy, Roy Gillis, is to a T, my husband. He is the least made-up character in the entire book. And they're like, oh, no, he gets love letters. I get love letters to give to him. So it's probably the fact that you have described this character through the eyes of love. And because you have so much love for him, you're only creating the best picture of him, which makes it a little bit more for the rest of us like, yeah, we haven't met that guy. We have not met him at all. But uh, trust me, he's not without faults, but he is just, he's perfect. See, spoken like a true woman in love. It is awesome. Thank you. You talked about being an educator and having actually three other books in a whole different world. So very nonfiction. How was your transition from nonfiction to fiction? How did that go? It was really very different. And in some ways, I had to do some answers for another interview. And it was far more about my process of, you know, starting in higher education. And then how did I wind up through all these years of finally being a novelist and doing all of these interviews, etc. And it really made me go back to the idea that we're always recreating ourselves. When I started out in higher education, I thought I was going to live forever in the field of higher ed. I loved it. I was married to a university professor, and I thought I was going to totally happily ever after. We had two children. And then a new senior vice president came in and decided I should be gone, and I was gone in days. And that was after 10 years. So that was a big shock. And then I was pretty unemployable because I had two small children. My husband decided he wanted a divorce like three months later. I needed to totally recreate myself. And I just answered a teeny tiny ad in the Washington Post that said, educational consultant needed to help educators get out into the world of work. And I had no idea what that meant. And you can tell because I said a little teeny tiny ad in the Washington Post. It was back in the day when we still poured over classifieds. I went from being unemployed to being executive director of a nonprofit, and then I created my own for-profit educational consulting firm to support that, and all in two days. So it really was a little bit about making, not making myself up and certainly not being inauthentic, but reinventing myself. So I did that, and that was the world of writing, because I had to do a lot of grant writing. I had to do curriculum writing. Then at one point, we created yet another nonprofit. We were teaching teachers across the country how to improve high schools. And it was at a time in American education, this just goes back about 10 years, where we were creating large high schools into smaller learning communities. So I worked in every single big city. We started in Washington, D.C. with 16 schools. We did Detroit. We did Houston. We did huge major cities. Uh, we rewrote the plans for Louisiana. I've done a lot of work throughout, well, I said 32 states. And then as that was winding down, again, I just went to the writing but the publishing process was incredibly different. And for your listeners who like to know about that process, which they will because of the title of your podcast, when I went to get my first educational book published, I sent out 14 query letters and got 11 requests back from publishers which was really unprecedented. And I just picked a wonderful deal with Corwin Press. They had everything I wanted, including a good royalty deal. And they were super well-respected. So I went with them. In the world of novelists, what surprised me is it's much harder to get your work published, as you know so well. One of what we I used to call real publishing, and now I just call traditional publishing, and I'm not even sure I'm comfortable with that term anymore. As you know so well, with the indie publications and the world of being an indie author, there's a whole gamut of what that actually means to be an indie author. 
So that transition was huge. So I found a publishing house, uh, which is Writing Nights with Chad Robertson. He's fabulous. He has all the services I need. He did all the positioning I needed for Barnes and Noble and for Amazon. And we're tracking it about a 4.9 stars on Amazon, which is great. He also was a great coach for me in terms of that whole what I need to do, because Unless you've lived this life, particularly in the pandemic, most people do not understand how hard authors need to work. You know, whether I alluded earlier to the Instagram and the podcasting, and I was somebody who really shied away from that. So to think of the daily posts and to respond and to come up with the right things to say and I'm very comfortable in the world of podcasts and interviews and writing interviews, but not a lot of authors are. I think many of us are secretly very introverted, even though, you know, people think we're not. I never come across as introverted, but trust me, after we do this, I will just go and need to decompress someplace. I love doing podcasts. I love doing book clubs. If your listeners, you know, are members of book clubs, they can contact me. I will happily zoom into their book clubs. I will do other podcasts. I love this because I get a lot of energy from it. But the transition to this from the other writing, the work that that entails is really remarkable to me. That is a huge learning curve. And I like the fact that you just embraced it. You went with it. You're going, I'm going to try this and we're going to make the most of it. And that's amazing. You know, it's funny. I know that you're doing some work um, coming up in a seminar, which sounds absolutely fabulous. I think a lot of us have what I've used the term often, and it's a commonly used term, that imposter syndrome, where you think this people can't possibly be thinking this, that you're this great, or they have a preconceived notion of what an author's life is like. And I would say I don't really have imposter syndrome, but I do go back and forth between thinking, you know, I've had four interviews this week. I've got a couple next week. And that must mean that people are interested in the book and that it's going well. And the royalties, you know, there nobody makes big money on these books. And that's another thing listeners should understand. But I go between that. Oh, I am all that and a slice of bread to thinking, oh, my God, I just got kicked off somebody's Facebook post because I posted the wrong thing in the wrong group. Maybe that's just being 67. I don't know. Not at all. Everybody does it. Trust me. It is different rules and different playing fields. And I usually tell everybody, I think for the most part, the writing is the fun part. Like, that's the sexy part. Every writer falls in love with it. That's why we write. That's why we connect. It is the getting out there and talking to the people in a different environment. So the fact that you're doing podcasts, the fact that you're doing Facebook posts is exciting because a lot of people don't. It is very time consuming. It can be one of those rabbit holes that you don't come out. And as you know, it's very different parts of most of our brains. You know, that writing thing is very solitary, at least for me. I was listening to some interviews this week about people who write together. And I don't know how they do that. I've done that in my technical writing. But in my novel world, I don't know that I could do that. It would be fun to try. But the idea of writing is a very different than getting ready to talk to DC Gomez. It is absolutely very different. I have a couple of author friends who are partners in writing and I'm always going, who's typing? Like, I want to know the mechanics of it. Who's pressing the keys? And each one does it differently. I know a couple that they actually do it live. So like they're typing different characters and it's almost like role playing. Like one will type one part and the other one responds. They go back and forth in this universe. And I'm like, that is incredible. I don't know if I can do it. I'm with you. It's like, yeah, I don't know about that. But I love maybe it. I love the book. Outline. Maybe if I was a planner, maybe with an outline. I think they pants, actually. I don't think they outline. They literally <laughs> just go with it. So I'm always going, I love you. Blown away. That is awesome. You started mentioning a little bit about where you get your inspiration. And then you kind of went, okay, we'll come back to that. Tell us about it. Where do your ideas come from? For the eaves, it really comes from a place deep inside of me of wanting our stories to be told. If you look at the cover of the book, which is just, I absolutely love my cover, but there's a subtitle and it's, when our stories are told, everything changes. And that's certainly very true of Jessica. And it's very true of the other characters. When their stories are told, everybody changes. And that's such a core piece for me of listening to each other 
and wanting our stories to be told. Part of the inspiration for the book was there's a period of time, I think, for all of us when we're at an age, we're not really interested in listening to our parents' stories. We're all grown. We're large and in charge. You know, our parents are wonderful, but we're not really interested in their stories. And if we also have children at that time, our children certainly aren't interested in listening to our stories yet. We're kind of right there in the middle. I wanted to do this generational piece where if we listen to each other's stories, it would really be profound. And so that was the inspiration. But then there were all sorts of little nuggets. I frequently talk about good authors are first and foremost good listeners because we steal conversations a lot, or at least I do. I know, for example, there's a scene in the book where one of the characters who is part Native American, is talking about her mother's birth and how her mother was whisked away on a horse. And the line in the book is, and I was baptized at midnight on the back of a horse. And that's a beautiful line, which I never created. When I was working on some Native American lands here in the United States, this goes back 14, 15 years ago, one of the women was telling me a story, which was much longer than that. So I don't take her whole story, but that sentence was really beautiful. So I wrote it down and then, who know, you know, I did not know it was going to pop into this book, but there it was. So I like to listen to people's stories. There's little nuggets of things that we pick up all along the way. And I keep a notebook. Well, it used to be a notebook. Now it's like a file. I just throw pieces of paper in and then go back and find that sentence that's just the right sentence. That is an awesome technique that you do. I think John Maxwell does something similar. He collects quotes and he has a binder, several binders now at his house as well. And then as he's writing his book, he goes and pulls them out and picks the sentences. So it is an amazing practice that if anybody's looking for material, something to pick up that I really enjoyed. I also think I love to learn. And I'm intrigued by factoids. I'm intrigued by, I didn't know that. I'm intrigued by the kind of people who listen to NPR and then can say, oh, I heard that on NPR today. And there's all these little factoids that I wove into the eaves. Some of them I didn't know were going to be there at all, but they turned out to be very um, timely. So, for example, there's a part in the book where Jan, who's an African-American woman, is talking to one of the Caucasian characters, Deirdre, in the book. And they're going back and forth about events that they're going to have on their farm. They live on a sustainable farm. And one of the characters talks about how she really wants a Juneteenth celebration at the home. And the other character, being a Caucasian woman, doesn't have a clue. I wrote that all of two years ago. I did the research for that. The two characters are talking about it. I would tell you that until the horrors of this summer with Mr. Floyd, most people would not have known, most white people would not have known about Juneteenth. And that was just like one of those things when I was doing some research about what would this character want to have as an event on the farm? I went and did some work, just did a little bit of research, found out all about Juneteenth, found that entire fact that in your home state, slavery continued for two more years past when it was, you know, this white girl didn't know that. So I just was very struck by those kinds of things. And without bombarding the reader with them, I just went like, oh, everybody should know this. It's a great thing to be a researcher and to actually be able to love learning and to submerge in that experience. Because sometimes a lot of people just stare clear because they're not comfortable in the unknown. So the fact you're taking these steps and continue to take these steps is really fun. Tell us, what is one lesson you have learned in the writing of your novel? The lessons I have learned, and in some ways, and I'm just going to go back to the novel before I answer it. In the back of the novel, there are a couple of pieces. There are the traditional like book club things, book club questions. There's also a bunch of conversation questions so just so people can have good conversations with each other. There's recipes. There's a music playlist that Jessica listens to. There's also a list of life lessons. As Jessica kind of gets her act together, she writes down what she calls her living lessons. 
when I was zooming to a book club recently, one of the women asked me, are those your life lessons? And in some ways they are, as Jessica learned them, or as I learned them and put them in Jessica's wheelhouse, if you will, they are my life lessons. I think never be done, be kinder than you need to be, seek first to understand, do no harm, you know, just continue to learn. And there's there's a bunch of them in the back of the book. But I think that it's the process of those things and who I want to be in this world in terms of a personal thing, in terms of the what did I learn in the process of writing the book. It's what we talked about earlier of how much harder it is to be this on the other side of the typewriter, if you will. It is a little bit of transition, but you're doing amazing and you're succeeding in creating your own path, which is really, really fun. So with the same concept in mind, what advice would you give a brand new author that is interested in following these steps? I would say, figure out why are you writing? That's a really important question. And there's it's kind of a two-part question. Why are you writing? Are you writing for yourself? Are you writing for fame and fortune? Are you writing for a blog? You know, what is that why are you writing? And then the other one, which is a little bit more difficult and certainly more difficult for me to judge, certainly not anybody else, but for myself, is how will you judge your own success? For me, my first success was just I did it. I wrote it. It's real. I can hold it up. I have a little bit of traction, whether it's newspapers, TVs, podcasts, I've got a little bit of traction. So in my world, I have met the success that I wanted. Part of that success is when I have readers say, please, can there be a sequel? When I have a 94-year-old woman write to me and say, please let there be a sequel in my lifetime. How's that for pressure? When I get a reader who emails me and says, I haven't talked to my kids in five years, and now we're talking because I sent them your book. Those are successes that are just incredibly precious. Now that I've had those, I really, really want it to be a Netflix or a movie. I think that's perfect. I think a lot of authors settle very short instead of just putting out there. Put it out to the universe. Tell us what you want. I think that's awesome. I actually direct messaged several people the other day saying, you know, this book was written with you in mind. You need to just make it a show. Yes, absolutely. That is awesome. We want to know, where can we find you? Where can our listeners find the book? Where they can get more information about you? Tell us. Well, my last name is Salmon. Sounds like the fish, but it's spelled S-A-M-M-O-N. So you can find me on Instagram and Facebook at Grace Salmon Writes, like Grace Salmon Writes Books, all one word. So you can find me there. You can find me on Twitter and LinkedIn as well, although I spend most of my time in Instagram and Facebook. My website is gracesalmon.net. Again, that's S-A-M-M-O-N. And you can email me directly. Please feel free to do that at grace at gracesalmon.net. I love hearing from readers. We love it. We love it. It is awesome. So are you ready to change gears? I am going so ready. We're going to our lightning round. Easy peasy. Don't think too hard on them. Let's see what we can come up. Ready? Okay, I'm ready. First one. Pancakes or waffles? Pancakes. Nice. Wizard or knight? Wizard. Okay. Documentary or action film? Mm, documentary. No, action <laughs> film. <laughs> you have to think about it. Like, wait, wait, wait. Which one? Okay, hold on, hold on. Okay. Cats or dogs? Both, but dogs if I have to pick. Golden Retrievers specifically. They're so cute. Oh, oh the best. Okay, but here is our last question. Let's see how you do. If you could pick any vehicle to describe your personality, what would you pick? Oh, my goodness. Oh, goodness. That's the hardest question ever. A vehicle. I'm going to say a Maserati, but I don't really know why. That's what came to mind. That's it's not really a bad common. thing. No, it's not a bad thing. We're going to go with it and rock it. Absolutely. Madam, do you have any closing remarks for us? Listen, read, write, contact me. Listen to DC. She's brilliant. 
you're too sweet. Oh my god. But um, it has been such a pleasure to have you on the show. It's been such an amazing time talking to you. And to our listeners, thank you so much for joining us in another episode. Please give this episode a like, share it, follow us on, follow Miss Grace. Let's continue to build this community together. And I'll see you guys again for another exciting episode and a brand new author. Bye, everyone. Take care. Thank you.